Hello and welcome to another episode, a real special one, of the PU Football Podcast. This is definitely a non-soundproof terrace in uh, the Costa Brava, that's the northeast coast of Spain. And uh, I am doing this podcast from here because this is where a lot of the writing of the Maradona book, The Boy, The Rebel, The God, that's what I decided to call it, was written. Uh, in this terrace overlooking the sea is where the first three months of the, uh, of the pandemic found me. And basically it was the first time in like 30 years where I spent... Uh, I spent it in the same bed, in the same place. Obviously, uh, it was the beginning of uh, something that was scary and that we did not know what it was going to take us and certainly uh, something we hadn't found before. But my emigrant DNA kicked off and, uh, and basically I decided to use the time. And I think, I think I've explained Maradona. I explained Maradona my own way. Uh, as I always do with the um, with the subjects of my biographies, they are basically um, taken for a ride with me. Uh, we just I look at it from a sociological point of view, historical point of view, footballistic point of view. Of course, they are football related people, but at the end, they are people with their up and downs, with the difficulties. And what I found was that Maradona was pff, everything I've written about and more. It's the most complex character I've ever faced in, in, in my life in terms of writing, but also I don't think I've, I've known anybody close to that. This is a look back at uh, how I did the book, how it all worked out for me. A uh, few things that I've learned about Maradona, not everything, because otherwise what would be the point of reading the book? But also I'll have the, um, I've chosen three paragraphs, three uh, extracts, Uh, which I want my friend William here with me to actually read. And by reading it and by listening to it, it will bring back memories and I'll be able to look back at, uh, as I said, the, um, the process of the writing, uh, of the researching, uh, some of the trips I've done and, and the consequences of getting to know some, somebody like that. Uh, we should start with the first extract. The hand of God. Valdano loses control of the ball and it bounces up and over his shoulder. Midfielder Steve Hodge is covering, anticipates and has a half second to choose his next move as the ball loops up into the area. Butcher slows down, waiting and expecting Hodge to clear the danger. Hodge, who has a trusty left foot, stretches and volleys the ball with the outside of his left boot back to Shilton to catch. Deliberate back passes to goalkeepers were still permitted at the time. The connection is good and Hodge sends the ball high making Shilton's claim easier. Shilton doesn't realise it's a back pass and doesn't foresee it, losing a vital half second in the race to the ball. Still, he thinks he'll be the first to the ever-rising ball Maradona impulsively jumps, crucially before Shilton does. Hodge is surprised to see Maradona bearing down on the goalkeeper. Why is he there, he asks himself. I'll never reach it. Please, come down, come down, Diego says to himself. He has an idea. What if, standing at five foot six, Maradona has no choice but to jump for the ball and stretches his arm to provide leverage for his jump. He is in the air. His muscular legs have helped him climb high and he pulls them into his body like a frog to gain extra ascendancy. His upper body is stretched out. He doesn't know if he'll get there before Shilton, but he's gambling on it. If they catch me, they catch me, he thinks. The goalkeeper still has the advantage and starts to lift himself too, both arms raised. You know what happens next. Sometimes it doesn't matter what happens next. 
uh, if you create enough uh, drama, really, to, um, to be able to um, make you forget what happens next, well, that would be success, really. It's that uh, moment, that game, that changes the life of uh, Diego Armando Maradona. Uh, interestingly enough, yes, if uh, Gary Lineker had scored that second goal that uh, he almost did score right at the end of the game in which England were on the app and then there was extra time and England wins, what's the story of Maradona like then? What happens? You know, it's, uh, he's, the, uh, he's the army of... Uh, uh, of the anti-English, isn't he, at that point? He's the, the general that uh, wants to revenge something, even though they hardly speak about the, the, uh, the Falklands uh, amongst, publicly anyway, Maradona and his teammates and the manager. They didn't want to talk about politics at the time, but of course it was a relevant part of what was happening on that day. But what happens if he had gone a different way? How do you explain the myth? Uh, and the story of Diego. In any case, uh, that allowed him and everybody else around him in a way to um, rewrite history because there was a success and as Ch Churchill used to say, the ones who win write history. They were able to um, frame that victory against England as part of something much bigger. Well, I explore that, of course, uh, in like, I think, four chapters. That game in four chapters, because I wanted a lot of detail on it. I spoke a lot of people related to it. And basically, I wanted to uh, make sure that we got all the angles from that World Cup in general, in which he was absolutely extraordinary, but from that game in particular, because of the ramifications of it. This has got so many layers. Uh, and uh, the, there is, of course, a before and after that. Um, but to understand Diego, you have to go back. You have to go to his youth. You have to go to his childhood. You have to go to his parents. You have to go to his uh, brothers and sisters. You have to go to the friends that help him grow. You have to go to, um, to the fact that somehow, from the beginning, he was the, the very first one at many things. He was the start of many things. So even though that was the peak of his story, to actually get to the Ormando Maradona as a, as a player and as a man and understand the up and downs, um, you have to go back to um, his way of thinking and how he was the first one to have a physical trainer and was the first one to actually have a press officer, was the first one to point out FIFA is corrupt, UF is corrupt. And probably we didn't believe him at the time. We thought, ah, he's, he's just a bit crazy. He was the first one at uh, creating a star system around him. Uh, he allowed uh, Jorge Sistapilla, his agent, to do that. Uh, and that's because he had a vision of what uh, a superstar required and needed. Now, that is, yeah, that's a vision. So there were so many things that he, was, um, he should be remembered for. For instance, he created the first trade union. He thought the players needed, um, needed help. Uh, needed to organize themselves, uh, even though that, that failed. Uh, that he was helped uh, by Eric Cantona in his first appearance of that trade union. I think it, it was back in Paris. So he was all that, but he was also a lot of lows, a lot of difficulties, um, a mind that drugs made worse, but a mind that in itself, from very early on as well, proven to be a... Um, as we call Russian, Russian mountain, an up and down of emotions. Uh, he would feel like leaving football when he was 21. Did you know that? He didn't want to play football anymore. And he uh, recovered because he was in love with the ball. The ball certainly is something that saved him in many, many occasions. But he, um, he, meet, he mixed alcohol and cocaine and then many other things which... Uh, blurred his mind and at the end he became uh, a very conflicted person uh, that didn't respect his wife, didn't respect his uh, partners and, uh, and didn't respect the profession and he will admit that himself. Why and, uh, we still admire him? You have to look at history, you have to look at sociology of Argentina, 
of Napoli, of Italy, of Spain. I feel that he was very well treated at Barcelona. But, um, as I say, you, you need to uh, jump into the pool of, of the book and into those pages to, uh, to get to understand better in a calm um, uh, and, and relaxing uh, process of reading uh, what, what is Maradona still for us and what he will always be. Which um, brings us into another extract. The match in Achera. There are numerous examples of Maradona's altruism. A teammate, midfielder Pietro Puzzoni, asked Diego if he would play in a friendly to raise money for emergency surgery for a boy with a disease in his palate. The match was to be played at the Comunale di Acera, a poor suburb some 15 kilometers from Naples, Puzzoni's hometown. Ferlano feared injury to his prize asset and thought he could stop him playing by insisting he had no insurance for the game. Diego spent the equivalent of 20,000 euros on insurance. He was going to play no matter what the president thought. The town's club was called Acerana, and that day they played a team that included Maradona, Lalo and Puzzoni himself. The stadium had doubled its capacity to 12,000. The pitch was boggy, the teams warmed up in the car park, and they played an illegal 12 versus 12 to avoid any interventions from the Football Federation. Some 5 million lira was raised. Diego scored two goals, and the boy underwent a successful operation in France. Heaven and hell often meet in the same lifetime, and Puzzoni has now returned to Acera, a prisoner to his post football addictions. He is living on the street. The story of uh, the Ormondo Maradona is a story of many other people that were close to him, that whose life changed because they were close to him, because they touched uh, his divinity in a way. I think his parents were in awe of him, for instance, and quite clearly um, they they felt that they needed to devote their life to him, even though he had brothers and sisters that perhaps needed them more, or at least as as much. That is uh, also one of the fascinating sides of, uh, of the Armando Maradona, what happens to the dreams of, of the brothers and sisters, uh, what happens to the dreams of the parents who just follow him, especially the parents, follow him wherever he goes. Uh, parents that did not want to believe what was happening to him, especially when he gets to uh, Naples, uh, didn't want to believe all the rumors about uh, how his mind was going, how he was getting uh, addicted to co cocaine. Uh, and what I found by, yeah, traveling to Naples, for instance, I was there the day uh, after he died. Um, I'd been covering the uh, Inter Milan Real Madrid on Tuesday in, uh, in Milan. And that evening he died. So we covered, we forgot a little bit about the game and we covered the, uh, his death. And then as I was in Italy at that time, and then I, I went to Naples. And in that, uh, uh, being in Naples allowed me to understand as well a little bit what was attractive um, of Naples to Maradona, what he was attracted to. Um, the first thing that I found is that uh, it's very much like Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires I, was, I went to and uh, I've uh, been to the Diego Armando Maradona Stadium. Uh, so I went to the stadium, Argentina Juniors Stadium, uh, which is a little bit derelict. But Buenos Aires itself with people... Um, dancing in the streets and having wine in the streets in certain squares in Buenos Aires, very much like Naples. So I could see what the attraction was from, uh, for Diego. And it was raw, of course, the emotion that I found around the stadium. First, 500 people getting together just um, to be there and share their, their, their grief. Uh, eventually, more and more people came in. And it was an interesting time because, of course, I had been isolated for most, for most of seven months writing the book and, and, of course, the pandemic. And all of a sudden, there were thousands of people and mostly young men smoking cigarettes, uh, no mask, most of them, or at least not covering them, really. 
uh, very close to each other with flares, red flares around the stadium. At some point, actually, there were like, I don't know, it must have been 10,000 people with red flares. Oh, there was an organized homage uh, just before the uh, Europa League game that Naples was playing that, that day. And I felt asphyxi asphyxiated. I had to just walk away from it. Um, but yet again, I realized, ah, that's the love, the devotion that Naples offered Maradona. These were young people that did not know Maradona uh, at all, had not seen Maradona, even though they chanted, I've seen Maradona, I've seen Maradona. No, you didn't, but the parents had. And they, he left an imprint. He left, um, he left uh, an impression of somebody that was, that was a rebel, that was also a god for them, that was a, a, a child, a kid, uh, too, that loved football. He was celebrated... Uh, the 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 the, uh, the youth of uh, Naples were celebrating him as um, a little bit. Uh, uh, were saying goodbye to, or no, not so much goodbye. They were actually saying, "We will never forget you." That's what they were saying. And like in Argentina, I was watching the pictures of what was coming from there, and what, what we were getting was uh, the, the, the the despair, the tears. Uh, you know, people following following the the path of the um, of the of the. Uh, of the of the car that was taking him to the cemetery, um, in one occasion I think there's one person that actually gets in front of the car uh, in the motorway, wanted to disappear the same day that Maradona had disappeared. Anyway, it was it was a, a different kind of God that we say goodbye to compared to the one I saw in, in Naples, but uh, all that craziness was what he lived in in uh, in Naples and what um, his parents had to kind of deal with as well. Um, and as I say, parents never really fully believed what it was, be, it was being told, they were being told the difficulties that he was going through. And that Diego is, of course, a Diego that could not hold and control his addictions, an ill person. And I think that story hasn't really been told properly, not in, not in the Anglo-Saxon world, perhaps a little bit more in the in Argentinian, uh, in Spanish. Uh, that Diego, that was um, that was an ill person, that uh, that could not control his emotions or his addictions. I think very often uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, he's described as the cheat, as the uh, drug addict. Um, and now I'm thinking, do you know football should have done something about this? No, you're talking about uh, one of the biggest representations of the game, ill, and football kicking him, uh, kicking him in around kicking him first but also pushing him away and it's like you get well on your own i don't i wouldn't like us to treat footballers this way and i think we are changing the way we're doing so but again he was the first one treated that way because of course authorities and power fifa uefa the federations as well including the argentinian one saw him as a rebel as an enemy there's all that to Diego Armando Maradona as well as the beautiful of his football, which you heard in the first extract. But uh, before I go, I'd like you to hear another extract. The cocaine. Someone, Diego never said in front of a camera who, offered the footballer cocaine. The fictionalised series of his life, produced by Amazon, adds a disturbing fact. Allegedly approved by Maradona himself, his former father-in-law. Roque Nicolas Villafagne, Popo, Claudia's father, was the one who introduced him to the drug. According to their daughter Dalma, Diego denied to Claudia that he had agreed to tell this peculiar version of the story. Although even Claudia also seems to think that he consumed cocaine for the first time on that last evening in the Catalan city. Diego felt alive. His initial emotion was of a shock wave, of wanting to take the world by storm. And in subsequent experiences, the feeling was similar. Everything was so beautiful, so clear, and everything was so funny. Every time he took cocaine, he won a title or a cup. So what does anything else matter? After the highs came tremendous loneliness, fear and self-doubt. To remove himself from that state, he had to rediscover the feeling of being alive over and over again. Maradona became a regular bathroom ghoul, haunting them not only in his own house, but in restaurants and bars. He even partook in the Papal Palace 
during a private audience with Pope John Paul II, granted to Napoli in 1985. Often the light would be turned off, and in the dark, Diego would powder his nose a little. His fear of his wife or Dalma catching him led to him putting latches on the toilet doors at home. Dramatic, isn't it? It's playing uh, red that way as well. Uh, makes it even more dramatic. Um, there is, and with this I want to finish, uh, there is cinematographic stories, if you like, or the way they try to put them across, so you can see it as well as read it. You can imagine it as well as read it. Uh, because, yes, uh, the story of uh, the Ormonda Maradona was the story uh, that is not is too big for for a movie. <laughs> it's too big for the cinema, but it is really um, cinematographic. I uh, I had a plan. I had the plan of uh, of actually write the book and then go to Argentina, uh, get close to him in a even though his circle kind of had him in inverted commas, kidnapped, protected, away even sometimes from his own family, that he lived in a eternal state of sedation because of the medication that he was taking, and now we know it wasn't the right medication for a lot of the things that he was going through. So it would have been a useless exercise trying to tell him, look, I'm doing this. I've met him before. I've got in my own YouTube channel uh, a long conversation we had in, a, in Amman, in, in Jordan. Um, in which he went through a lot of things that uh, that he lived. Uh, we had common friends, and and it would have been uh, yes, an exercise to say, look, this this is same as you got the messy book, which he did get, and he himself spoke about uh, in a in a television show. Right, well now I've dealt with you. Uh, I don't know what uh, I could have got out of that. Uh, perhaps just um, perhaps just the satisfaction of say job done, you know, full circle. I've been thinking about about you and what you are and what you represent to us, and I've been thinking of the kid, and I've been thinking of uh, of why you rebelled so much and from the beginning, and uh, and and why we consider you a god, and this is my explanation of it. Uh, even if he if he held the book in his hands, it would have been job done, because right now uh, at this moment that I'm finishing the podcast and this uh, and this video. Uh, basically, the book is not mine anymore. The book is out there. It's yours. Uh, you will read things in it that I, ha I wasn't meant to to say. Uh, you won't get other stuff that I was, I was trying to say. Uh, I've mixed um, I've mixed literature and, as I said, cinema kind of pictures. Uh, I've I've tried to explain the uh, the context of uh, Diego Armando Maradona as a person and as an Argentinian, as a footballer. Uh, I, I've tried to also describe his magic, impossible, but then uh, I hope that uh, at least he can give you a glimpse of what he was able to do with that ball, that uh, that ball that, um, as he said, uh, you know, it, it shouldn't, um, and that's it's almost like an impossible, as a sentence that he says, la pelota no se mancha, uh, you don't dirty the ball, the ball doesn't get dirty. Uh, that's what he was trying to say, you know, it's um, it's me who is the dirty one. The ball is clean, football is clean. If, uh, if anybody did wrong uh, to the ball, it was actually me, and it was to football too, and to himself. He could have been so much better. He said it, he said it to me. I was 30% uh, of what I could have been, 30%. And I have found that actually he, he picked very quickly and went down very quickly, but all that and more in the book. I hope you, um, you enjoyed this introduction to, um, to the uh, to. Maradona, the uh, the boy, the rebel, and uh, the god. Uh, in uh, in Spanish, it would be uh, el pibe, el rebelde, el dios. And I hope that uh, that you come back and tell me your experience of it if you have read the book, and and that you um, give it to others and uh, allow them to experience what this extraordinary life of Diego Armando Maradona was like. I've tried to. Uh, do justice to it. I hope that um, I succeeded even in a ten percent of what uh, of what he was and what he gave us. So, thank you very much. That's the end of the Pure Football Podcast and this special Maradona episode. <laughs>